So we looked at the American bullfrog populations at just a few sites in the Little Campbell River watershed. And we looked at their effects on northern red-legged frogs. So this project is still kind of ongoing. We're going to combine our data from red-legged studies that we've been doing since 2009. And so this is the, is it the first year that we've done? Yeah, mm -hmm. bullfrog control. So yeah, so we're just kind of going to be looking at their effects for a multi-seasonal study. So some background on these guys. I know they look kind of evil in that picture in the top right, <laughs> and they are. Um, so American bullfrog, you guys probably all know what they sound and look like. So they are invasive to Western North America. They're actually native to the Eastern parts of North America. So Southern Ontario, I think they're actually native there. But here, they pose a huge threat to the ecosystems here. They outcompete native amphibians, particularly Oregon spotted frogs and Northern red-legged frogs. Uh, these bullfrogs eat absolutely everything. They have gape-limited predation, which pretty much means anything they fit into their mouth, they will eat, or at least try to. Um, so birds, native amphibians, small mammals, anything is really fair game if they can fit it into their mouth. And so there's no surprise that they can decrease prey items for other predators native to the wetland. And then they can also facilitate the spread of things like fungal pathogens, like chytrid fungus, to other native frogs in the wetland. Surprisingly enough though, not a lot of people know this, but they were actually brought here intentionally. Um, I think it was either after World War I or II, they were brought here into Victoria and Vancouver in the South Coast area to be farmed for frog legs. But the frog leg market never took off, ironically. So they had all these frog farms which essentially collapsed and then because it was the easiest and most energy efficient way of decommissioning these farms, they just released all the bullfrogs into the wild, and then they became established here. So the purpose of this study was to study bullfrog populations in wetlands where we knew that the northern red-legged frogs were already successfully breeding. So we want to eventually give our native wetland species uh, an upper hand, so we're not just looking um, for red-legged productivity to uh, boost, but also we have other amphibians like northwestern and long-toed salamanders, rough-skinned newts, Pacific chorus frogs, which all rely on these wetlands, which can be outcompeted by bullfrogs. And also the data from this study will complement existing red-legged frog data that we've been collecting for the last seven? No, seven years? Seven years. Yeah, and ultimately we want to help conserve the breeding habitat for red-legged so we can kind of ensure high uh, breeding productivity and help out other native species as well in the process. And hopefully after multi-seasons, uh, we'll be able to better understand the timing and identify some sort of predictability of when and where the bullfrogs reproduce. So this is the red-legged frog. This is the good native species that we like to see. That is like an evil but cute. <laughs> So there's 11 sites that we've been operating on, and so these 11 sites were selected on a pre, um, preceding bias that they were productive uh, red-legged breeding sites. And so we visited these 11 sites four times between June 19th and July 30th this summer. And so we looked, again, like the toad study, we looked at presence and absence of other amphibians, we looked for egg masses, dead weather, and habitat characteristics, and then we also did water quality as well. And when we did find egg masses in a wetland, we took GPS waypoints of where they were located in the wetland. We measured their diameter. So this is a picture of a bullfrog egg mass here in the bottom right. That's about 80 centimeters in diameter. So it's like big. Um, they're kind of hard to see. They're transparent. But when they start to mature after a couple days, they kind of get this frothy, bubbly look at the top, which is the easiest way to identify them. But if you have a really fresh one, they're almost like inconspicuous in the water. You can't really pick them out super easy. So when we found these, our way of controlling them was we would net them and drag them onto shore and allow them to desiccate and dry out, and that's a humane way of destroying the egg masses. And so our findings from this study, we only identified bullfrog egg masses in two of the ponds that we studied, and these were both at the Nature House in the Campbell Valley Regional Park. And so we were only able to identify seven egg masses in total, and we were able to destroy these. Um, and we also identified three sites where we knew the bullfrogs were reproducing. Uh, so the Brooksdale Pond just down this slope here does have bullfrogs reproducing, but unfortunately we missed the window this year of when they were laying eggs. They probably did this earlier in May because of the warmer summer or the warmer spring, and we kind of missed that window. But we were able to destroy seven egg masses, 
And um, the study we in the study we were also able to identify two wetlands which were ephemeral, so they actually dried up this summer, which is a good thing because if the wetlands dry up completely, then the bullfrogs can't su successfully reproduce because their larval stage lasts about two to three years. So it can benefit native amphibians and be non-beneficial for invasive ones if they are ephemeral, but um, nine of the sites are permanent water bodies and they all have adult bullfrogs in them. So one interesting thing that happened kind of unexpectedly in the study is that one of the wetlands we were studying dried up so quickly that we actually had to perform an amphibian salvage. So there was at least four species of amphibian that were stuck in these little dinner plate size like potholes just full of water. Um, barely full of water, that's kind of what they looked like there. And we were just pulling out hundreds, if not thousands of tadpoles that were otherwise gonna be just baked into the soil and they would have died. So uh, Joe, Laney and I actually moved them into buckets and moved into deep, deeper areas of the wetland to hopefully give them a better chance of surviving. And I went back there two days after and those little areas were already bone dry. So we got them just in time. And then two weeks after we performed the salvage, the entire wetland was dry. So hopefully those two weeks were enough for some to metamorphose and get out of the wetland, but here's a crazy dry summer, so these things are expected. So some conclusions and advice for future studies. We should and need to complete repetitive seasons of egg mass destruction in order to help control the capacity of bullfrogs to reproduce, but not only this, to help conserve the existing red-legged frog breeding sites. We want to make sure that they can continue to have high productivity in this area of the watershed and um, yeah, just ensure the future generations of our native species. And as I kind of alluded to before, how we missed the, the window here for catching eggs for bullfrogs, we do need to extend our sample period to incorporate May uh, to August, end of August, so that we can make sure that we identify as many egg masses as possible, just to get an accurate representation of how many bullfrogs are actually reproducing in the wetlands where we have red leggeds. And so, yeah, in tune with that, we need a stricter schedule for um, surveying for these egg masses because bullfrog eggs are really tricky. They can actually be laid, matured, hatched, and disappear within seven days. And so you, we kind of have to be visiting these wetlands every five to six days at least in order to actually catch them when they're still immature enough where they can be netted. So that's it for the sciencey part of my talk, but I'm just going to take a minute here and just kind of reflect on my journey through the last four months at Arasha. So I am from Aldergrove, so Langley Township, and I've grown up here my whole life. And it's been really interesting for me to actually engage and work hands-on with the native species that I share my backyard with. Growing up, I was always fascinated by the big, charismatic, you know, elephants, panda bears, things that are easy to love. But working at Arash has really taught me to appreciate things that I typically wouldn't fall in love with, like warty, stinky toads, and freshwater mussels that don't move, and things like dragonflies, which look kind of intimidating, and I'm afraid that they're gonna bite me every time I catch one, but like just things like that, just really kind of appreciating every creature for its, its, um, its value in the local ecology and just being able to kind of glorify God in that process and, and protecting species that I know he created for a reason. And so that's kind of brought me through a personal uh, journey here at Arasha, and it's been awesome. <laughs>